Okay, so I finally finished working on the uh, on the Ico 460 oscilloscope, and uh, just kind of doing this final video. It's I'm going to run through some frequencies here and see how it responds. Um, yeah, it's been a slugfest to get this thing up and working. Right now, I'm I'm driving it uh, with this WaveTech. Uh, with a thousand cycles basically I use this knob here in conjunction with that one and uh, I'm using the synchronization out of it and the function output so the timing and the actual signal is being provided by the wave tech um, you know like I say it, 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 you know I've been working on this I go for a long time I had to bring it up from from completely dead, well not completely dead, I had a dot in the middle of the screen, there was no uh, horizontal trace, there wasn't any kind of vertical deflection on it, None of none, nothing really worked on it. Um, there were blown out capacitors on the inside once I opened it up and looked, and uh, yeah, it, uh, I wound up having to replace just about everything. It took me quite a while to get it done because I'm trying to learn how to do this stuff and at the same time there's this problem of ordering parts you know when you're starting up in something like this you you never have the parts on hand you don't have the stock you need so every time you encounter a problem it's another order uh, same thing with the wave tech when i bought it it was broken it didn't work but i got lucky on this one because WaveTech really has great documentation. Uh, you know, I just followed the troubleshooting procedures, and uh, you know, I, I hooked the, uh, this oscilloscope. I use this oscilloscope to help troubleshoot it, and I, I went from you know maybe testing two test points inside here, and eventually it told me to take voltage measurements uh, on a on a cable called the J5 and. And when I looked at that cable, I could tell it was cocked. So it led me right to the right to where the fault was at. And I pushed that cable in and, and it worked. So I got really lucky on that. Anyway, um, yeah, so right now I'm driving it with a thousand cycles. Uh, I wanna see where the bottom end of it is to start out with. So I'll set this down to, you know, I'm changing the range here is what I'm actually doing. I had it up on 1K, and now I, you can see I've moved it down to 10, okay? And this is set to, to 1. So what, what I'm doing is just driving 10 cycles for this thing right now. And obviously, I'm going to have to change the range on it. And I think that's the bottom of the range. Let me see if I can get the sink to... Hold it still for me. Maybe that'll lock in there. It's close. So there we are, 10 cycles. Now the documentation on the uh, on this ICO 460 says, you know, hey, this thing can go down to one cycle per second, if you can imagine that. Um, I don't believe it, but I mean, not with the ranges that you got on here. This is the bottom range, but there's an external one and I've tied an external capacitor into this lead and then run it over to this ground. You can see there's a ground strap here and uh, you have an external capacitor uh, a range set here. So basically what I've done is I've, is I've taken a capacitor that's twice the size of the largest one or twice the capacity of the largest one um, this is 0.22 microfarad, and the one that I'm on right now is 0.1. So we'll see what happens when I when I switch this over to this external capacitor. And basically, what you can see is now I have. Whoops, it's a it's a little bit out of sync. Let's bring her in. But basically, I've got two pulses in the in the display right now instead of one. So yeah, now I'm down to five five uh, cycles per second um, but that's not one that's still quite a ways away so let me uh, I have one more capacitor here that's a 0.47 let me uh, let me plug that one in and see what happens
I've installed that 0.47 capacitor in there, that big one. And it looks like I've got, I don't know, three or four pulses now. At best, that's got me down to maybe two cycles per second. And it's, you know, at this point, it's really not very easy to read. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not sure what you would use this for. I could probably, yeah, maybe I could turn this a little bit and widen it a little bit better. So, yeah, that's about the best you could get it. That's too, uh, you know, maybe if you went in there with a 0.68 capacitor, you might be able to get it down to uh, to one cycle per second. I'm not sure what you would ever use it for, but, it, you know, I guess it shows that it could be done. Um, but what we'll look at now is uh, how high it will go. So I've got it turned up to... What's that now? Oh, that's 100, 100 cycles using that capacitor, but I want to get out of there. Or is that the? Yeah. That's 100 cycles. And let's bump the range up over here to 1,000 cycles. There's 1,000. We'll turn this up, this range up a little bit. So. There's 10,000 cycles, and again, you want to up the range again. And 10,000 cycles there, and we are at the, uh, the 1 to 10K on this side. So now we'll do 100,000 cycles. And again, you run into the same issue where you gotta you gotta go to the next range. The next range over here is one mega cycle. So I'm gonna. I don't have another range to go up, so all I can do is expand the. Uh, Expand the horizontal gain. So that brings it into one mega cycle. And really this thing doesn't go much higher than four mega cycles, but I'll I'll turn this knob up to two. Yeah, we lost the sink on it there. There's two mega cycles. If I want to go higher, I got to bump up to the next range on the wave tech, which means I got to turn this down to 0.2 and then go to 10 mega cycles over here. And sync is a little bit different when you move it to this range. Not as easy to bring it in, but yeah, that's uh, that's two mega cycles again, and this is three right there. That's in the range anyway. Um, we'll go up to four. Once you get around four, it gets pretty hard. This thing has a tough time with it. I'm talking about the 460, not the wave tech. You can see why. Look at this amplitude. See, there's a little attenuation starting to take place once you get around four. So I'm going to set it right at four. See if there's anywhere in here. It's a little bit noisy. It's in there if I can just get it to, to lock in. It 
So really four is about the top end that you could do and you probably wouldn't use it, use this for that. You'd probably jump over there and pull out the Tektronix that I got sitting on the floor. But um, it goes up to four megahertz, not five. Okay, um, so I'm gonna take this. I think we're at the max end of this thing. I'll take this down to 10K and we'll check the modulus. I mean, see if we can modulate a signal here. Hmm. We may want to go up one more. Maybe not. We'll see what happens here. So, yeah, uh, the WaveTech has a, uh, the stuff we've been working on here has been all down on the bottom for what's going to wind up being our carrier frequency. Um, but up here we have a, we have something to modulate the signal uh, or modulate that carrier. And it's got, you know, full functionality. I've, I've got multiple frequencies I can tune in and all the functions that I've got uh, on the carrier side. So, um, well, that's it, but it's not coming in too good. And I think the reason is because I'm still sinking off of the carrier frequency. So I'm gonna change this cord from that sink and I'm gonna put it on the modulated output and use that to sink off of. That should help me bring this in a little bit better. There we go. Uh, So I've got a, a modulating signal that's 1K and a carrier that's 10K. And I can take this up to, you know, you know, the megahertz range. And this is, this is typically how you see, you know, the modulated signal looking, you know, the, uh, the carrier frequency is much, much higher. So basically the, the modulated signal would be your voice. Um, uh, and it would be broadcast on top of, uh, the carrier frequency and that modulated signal could be reproduced and used to drive a speaker on your radio eventually. Uh, let's get this back in. What I wanted to show, the reason that I've got it, I mean, it's possible that I could take this down and actually have the, uh, the carrier frequency slower than the uh, modulated signal and it draws some pretty pretty wacky stuff but what I was interested in showing here was that um, you know, you have this, this, these, these functions that you can put in. So right now we're looking, we're looking at a, a sine wave and it's hard to tell, but I just changed the triangle waves. Um, and that's a square wave. And this is all on the carrier frequency, which is, you know, the higher frequency signal that you see there, the lower one is the uh, modulating signal. Um, I can do the same thing on a modulating signal. 
there's triangle right there. Where do I have this? Okay, yeah, I got that back to sine wave now. But you can see triangle, there's square wave. This is a sweep, uh, sweep pulse. And this is a sweep going the other way. I think that's all I've got on these. But it's kind of interesting that uh, that you can get this uh, old ICO 460 to, to work on all of this kind of stuff. So I'm basically thinking that I'm done with the 460. You know, there's a lot of other things I can do. There's always a lot of things you can do to, uh, to improve things a little bit. Um, on an old piece of equipment like this, there's always something you could work on. Anyway, um, but for now, I'm going to I'm gonna uh, quit working on it. it. It looks pretty good. I've got it cleaned up. Um, the next thing I'm going to work on is this, this oscilloscope here that I just got not too long ago. I've started working on it already. It's about 15 years older than the ICO. This is... Uh, this is designed, this, this schematic is from like 1937. And this one was probably built 19, 1939, maybe 1940. Um, this is a Dumont Labs Type 164. You can see the serial number on it. It was their first uh, commercial oscillograph. They called them oscillographs instead of an oscilloscope. Uh, Dumont was the Tektronics before Tektronics came along. I mean, they controlled the market for pretty much the entire war years and, and for a few years prior, maybe one or two years prior, but, but the derivative scope, the one that followed this one is 164E. And that sold quite a few. Uh, it was very popular, very popular uh, scope. Um, it's based, you know, it's very much like this scope, but uh, it has additional functionality. For instance, there's a there's another um, set of binding posts, not set, but a binding post right there, so you can tell um, you can tell the difference between them pretty easily. <clears throat> the first ones looked like this, you know, they had the same, the same uh, textured metal, which I think is really cool looking. Um, but once they got up to serial number 2700 or so, they started converting them all into E's. So the way that you see that serial number stamped into that plate right there, they would stamp an E next to the 164. They would drill a hole here and and put in that other. Um, I think it's I think it's just a test port is what it's called. Uh, it it's got additional functionality. It'd be nice to have, but it wasn't on this original oscilloscope of theirs. Um, later on, after they finished the run of these, they converted the front end to be a little bit more. Uh, Art Deco-y looking, so it, you know those are cool looking models of 164E, but this is the first one they made, so I'm kind of interested in this one, um, and I I really think there's something you know it's pretty cool looking this this uh, textured steel that they've got on here. I've kind of I kind of like developing a, you know a, you know I'm starting to like it more and more. Um, they don't have that kind of detail on the, uh, on the 460. 460 is nice. It, you know, it's brushed steel, but, and all of the text is stamped into the steel. It's hard to tell from here. It looks like it's just painted on, but it's not. It's actually stamped in there as well. But, uh, this is really cool looking, I think. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to get rid of all these chicken heads because of this this one piece here I can't I can't get the set screw to turn on it and that means I can't get it to cinch down and do its job and 
can't have one knob not work. And plus these two won't come off. <clears throat> I can't even turn a set screw to, to remove them. So I, I had to clean around it. And this thing was filthy. I'll post a picture alongside it here. Let me move the camera over. And it was was really in bad shape. A lot of, you know, for years and years, you get tobacco smoke on these things. And those of us that worked in, the, in test labs back in those days, we can kind of remember. Everybody smoked. <coughs> And nobody wanted to clean the test equipment. You know, it was all a bunch of guys. They just they just wanted to do their testing and move on. I've started to clean the inside a little bit, cleaned off all the tubes. I'm going to try to buff it out a little bit more. I'm going to have time to do that because, unfortunately, as much as I would like to bring this back as original as possible, the... Uh, the CRT, it's actually broken. Uh, I have it right here. This is it. It's broken here. Uh, you know, they don't really have a, a good way to cinch it down. And this is, I don't know if somebody broke it or moved it and it broke, but you can hear it squeak in there. At first, when I had it, it was coming and going. So I could get a signal, and then the signal would drop out. Then I'd get a signal, and the signal would drop out. So <coughs> it wasn't working very good, but it was working. Um, eventually, it stopped working altogether. And, you know, it's not impossible to find these tubes. It's just... You know, they're not available at the local uh, Home Depot. Same with these tubes here. So. <coughs> I, but I have some other things that I bought and I want to get around to working on. Look at this thing back here. This is called, you can't see it on the left hand side because that magnifying glass is in the way but it's a Supreme Autolyzer. <laughs> that's what the, I mean, that's perfect. That just sounds like a Flash Gordon type name, but it's out in 1936. Uh, what it is is, you know, a very early version of a signal tracer, but it's also a frequency generator that goes pretty high. It goes up into, uh, I think it's supposed to go as high as 50 megahertz for, and for those days, that's, that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty advanced uh, uh, signal generator. So uh, it also has an ohm meter built into it. So there's a lot of functionality in it. It's just, I just thought it was cool, you know, autolyzer. Um, and on top of that, I also have this Hickok oscillator, which the post office broke. Thank you, USPS. The glass on the meter on the right hand side is broke. The needle on the meter on the right hand side is broke. It wasn't when the guy shipped it to me. They broke it in the post office. You can see it. It comes from that up, that upper left hand, the one on the left hand side. You can see a chip of a bake light that's broken out there, and I've got it sitting there. I'll be able to glue it back in and maybe fix it because I've I've done that a lot of times restoring old phones. So hopefully I can make it look covered up as much as possible. It's one of those things where you always know that that crack is there. And what bothers me about it is that, is that this thing survived from the 1930s. It's got that really cool Art Deco look on it. Um, it survived from the 1930s and was, was in perfect shape until the United States Post Office came along and broke it, you know, and and, and I feel kind of guilty about it a little bit too, because if I hadn't have ordered it, this thing would probably not be broken right now. You know, somebody else, somebody else would, uh, would have it. And maybe they don't have the problems with the local post office that we do here where I live. So <clears throat> I don't know if you can tell, but I'm pretty, pretty pissed off about that, you know? This thing has survived all those years. It's been used by so many people. And, and the thing about 
about you know collecting stuff is that you don't just think about the instrument. It's not just about the instrument. It's about the people who worked it, and uh, it just it just frustrates the hell out of me that they broke it. You know, just inexcusable. I called the uh, the uh, seller up and told him what happened. He thinks he may have a glass bezel to replace that. It would be great if he did. Uh, he's a great guy. I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll ship it to me for free. He probably feels as miserable about it as I do. Um, how they broke, how they chipped the meter on the left-hand side and broke the bezel on the meter on the right-hand side and the, uh, the indicator wire is beyond me, you know, without breaking the, uh, the glass on the one on the left. I don't know how they manage that. That's, that's a new trick, you know. But anyway, uh, so I've got that. And then I've got another, another device back in the corner. You can't hardly see that. I forget what that's called. But it's, you know, it, it measures capacitance, resistance, and all of those kinds of things. But it, it has a cool name, too. I think it's a, a capo meter or something like that. It's got that same, that same cover, same type of, uh, of a face as this. You know, it's got that, that textured look that you really don't see very much anymore. Anyway, I'm kind of closing out the work on the Ico for now. I've got plenty of stuff to do for this summer, and uh, if you made it this far, thanks for watching.